Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Jeffrey Hayes, Education Specialist for the American Society for Reproductive Medicine. Welcome to the latest presentation of the ASRM Grand Rounds webinar series. These webinars are designed to address topics in the ABOG Guide to Learning in Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility. Today's presentation will be given by Dr. Alexander Rykovich. Dr. Rykovich is currently in the Department of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Reproductive Sciences at the University of Pittsburgh McGee Women's Research Institute in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The title of his talk today is Diagnostic Advances in Reproductive Medicine Through Genomics. I will now review the details of today's presentation. After the webinar is done, please do not forget to return to ASRM eLearn to take the post-test and complete the survey for your continuing education credits. You must complete the post-test question successfully and complete the survey to receive credit and be able to print off your certificate. If you wish to ask a question to the speaker about today's presentation, when you return to ASRM eLearn, click on the page link labeled Questions, and an email address will be provided. The question period will only be open for a three-week period after this presentation is posted. After the time period for questions has expired, the questions page will become a frequently asked questions page pertaining to this presentation and topic. We are very excited and honored for our talk today, so I will now turn things over to our speaker. Thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, today I will uh, discuss the diagnostic advances in reproductive medicine through uh, genomics. The learning objectives of this particular presentation is to explain how new genomic tools have allowed us to analyze many genes in a single assay. I will also summarize the process for detecting carriers for vast majority of Mendelian disorders. I will also discuss the utility of diagnostic exome sequencing in reproductive medicine for developmental disorders, the ethics of incidental findings and physician obligations, and also current uh, population-based genomic screening in diagnosing high penetrance uh, disorders. The Human Genome Project began in 1990 and culminated in 2003. It was a large scientific project financed mainly by the government and in smaller measure private interests whose goal was not only to sequence the human genome, but to also better understand the genomes of model organisms help develop technologies that will allow rapid sequencing of genomes, understand human sequence variation, and the function of human genes. The consequences of the Human Genome Project are technical and bioinformatics innovations that are now enabling unprecedented resolution of genetic variants. The rise in dependable array and sequencing technologies led to many applications in clinical medicine primarily in the areas of preconceptional, carrier screening, pre-implantation genetic testing, prenatal genetic diagnosis and screening, as well as pediatrics and early adulthood, all areas that are of great importance to reproductive medicine. Now, if you look actually at the human genome, it is a large micromolecule that contains 3 billion base pairs. There are a total of 20,000 or so genes that occupy 1.5% of the genome. The rest of the genome is biochemically active and therefore likely to have a regulatory and structural role for the genome. From a clinical standpoint, it is difficult to interpret genetic variation outside of the known genes, which means that at this point in time, we can only interpret at most 1.5% of our genome. Genomic medicine has been practiced since 1956 when full chromosomal complement of a human cell was determined to be 46 chromosomes and that XX and XY were the sex chromosomes. What has changed since 1956 is the resolution. Here in this figure is the classical cytogenetics gem sustained chromosome spreads that show light and dark bands with resolution that is more than 5 million base pairs, which means that in order for us to see or detect change using these classical techniques, hundreds of genes must be missing. Fluorescent in situ hybridization is a technology that has further increased our resolution from millions of base pairs to a few hundred thousands of base pairs. 
In this figure on the left is the regular karyotype that shows that the X chromosome, uh, which we call here derivative X chromosome, has an extra piece on it. On the right is the fluorescent in situ hybridization using a fluorescent probe that is specific for the sex determining SRY gene and shows that this derivative X chromosome contains the SRY gene and therefore this individual is likely to present as a 46XX male with male external genitalia and testes often well virilized and sterile. Now the resolution is further increased with technology that has various names, such as Array Comparative Genomic Hybridization, or short Array CGH, or chromosomal microarrays, and if single nucleotide polymorphisms are also measured in the assay, it is also known as a SNP array. Now in panel A is a glass slide that uh, contains, as amplified in panel B, multiple dots that interrogate distinct regions of the genome. The resolution on these arrays can be as high as few hundred base pairs and can tell us whether a single exon or intron have been deleted or duplicated. In example here, as shown in panel C, uh, we have a, an embryo test DNA that is labeled uh, with blue fluorescent dye while control DNA is labeled with red, uh, they are then uh, hybridized, and if equal, equal amounts of DNA are present in both the test and the control, then the fluorescence will be yellow. If embryo's DNA region is duplicated, it will show up as green color, while loss of DNA will show up as an orange color. And these intensities are measured and plotted as shown in panels D and E, to allow interpretation of whether there is a loss of genetic material, hence deletion, or gain of genetic material, hence duplication. The chromosomal microarray is therefore looking purely for gain or loss of genetic material. Now here actually is a comparison of the classical karyotype shown on the right side, which is gem-sustained DNA showing the dark and light bands, and here we see that there is an extra chromosome 21. On the left side is how it looks on the array, where you have along the green line probes that interrogate various portions of the genome, and the chromosome 21 is delineated uh, at the bottom, and all the probes that interrogate chromosome 21 are shifted to the right showing a gain of genetic material and therefore this individual has trisomy 21. Now the advantages of array-based technologies uh, as uh, shown actually on the right side is that what's detected by array CGH or chromosomal microarrays only will be small genetic changes that are smaller than 5 million or so base per, which is the resolution of the classical cytogenetics, and therefore micro-unbalanced translocations or micro-deletions or micro-duplications will be detected by array CGH but not by karyotype. Both array CGH and karyotype will detect whole chromosome aneuploides, will detect uh, large unbalanced translocations, and they will also detect deletions and duplications that are larger than 5 million base pairs. What karyotype will detect that array CGH will not detect involves balanced translocations or inversions that do not involve gain or loss of genetic material. Now these events, balanced translocations and inversions, can lead to abnormal gene function because it may rearrange uh, the gene from its regulatory elements. Another technology that is very important is polymerase chain reaction that allows one to amplify small amounts of a DNA and here is an example of the embryo where from only few cells uh, DNA needs to be amplified so that the equipment can process the information and polymerase chain reaction is utilized in this particular process. In this particular case, we also have a mutation that is present in the sample uh, that is amplified 
and then by Sanger sequencing can actually be detected as either a benign polymorphism or a pathogenic uh, variant. Now whole exome sequencing, also referred in the literature as diagnostic exome sequencing, is the ultimate technique at this time in clinical medicine that allows capture and sequencing of all the known coding exons. Here in this picture we have the genomic DNA, the exons are shown in green and labeled 1 to 6, while entrants are uh, shown in a light brown color. The exons is what codes for amino acids and that's what will be spliced to form the RNA to be translated. Genomic DNA is fragmented, it's captured, and then uh, the bioinformatics uh, is used to determine what the sequences are. Whole exome is the ultimate gene panel when a clinician is uncertain about a genetic diagnosis. Smaller, so-called next-generation sequencing panels that capture few to hundreds of genes implicated in various diseases, such as panel for skeletal dysplasia or panel for ovarian insufficiency, are processed very similarly. The sequencing generates significant amount of data and requires specialized software to determine genetic variation, whether such variation accounts for patients' pathology. Now here actually is an example of what the results look like. And on the left side we have a heterozygous individual that actually carries both C and G variants at one position. And as we can see, each line is an independent read generated from the machine and when somebody tells you that the coverage is more than 100x it means that a particular nucleotide is covered more than 100 times by each individual read. Now this individual again is heterozygous because you have some reads that have a C and some reads that have a G in addition to other nucleotides. So at that particular position this individual is heterozygous and then the other individual is homozygous for this particular variant uh, as shown on the right side. Now bioinformatics is very important because techniques such as whole exome sequencing can generate hundreds of thousands if not millions of variants that makes us different from other individuals genomes. Now in this analysis we take the total number of variants that differ from a reference genome and this reference genome could be is really the genomes that have been sequenced initially as part of human genome projects they're based on only few individuals so of course they're not normal per se but nonetheless they're used as standards and using various filters that include mode of inheritance whether they are in the exons whether they change amino acids you can diminish the number of variants for analysis. Now going back to the basics of nucleotide variation, a lot of uh, vocabulary has changed. What we used to call mutations uh, are now called variants and on the left side is a sequence that, that codes for amino acids in panel A. We assume that this is a normal sequence in panel B, there is a nucleotide change, but this nucleotide change doesn't change the amino acid, and therefore this is most likely what we call a benign variant. On the other hand, in panels E and panels F, we have nucleotide changes that introduce a stop codon or cause a frame shift mutation, which means that the frame has changed and now the downstream amino acids are different than what the regular protein has. And these variants are likely to be pathogenic variants that will cause dysfunction of this particular gene. Now, to show you some of the applications of the technologies and how they are penetrating what we do in reproductive medicine, we'll start off with preconceptional care. Now, preconceptional visit is a very important time point to discuss clinical histories of both partners as well as to gather family history for assessment of genetic risks such as history being a carrier for a genetic disease, undiagnosed genetic disorder in a family member, family history of chromosomal abnormalities. 
Now, pedigree is a very important part of this exercise. And here is what we call three-generation pedigree with Roman numerals on the left side showing each generation. And this family history can reveal if there is a preponderance of certain disease. In this particular family, the circles are females, the squares are males, and the filled circles usually mean an affected individual. In this case, we have two women who appear to have the same disorder and this inheritance is likely to be autosomal recessive meaning parents are carriers for a particular gene trait and have 25 percent of having an affected child. We also on the pedigree want to note whether there is any consanguinity among the family members because that will increase the chance that there may be a risk for autosomal recessive disorder. However, family history will not reveal if one is a carrier for recessive disease that can impact their child's health if all the family members appear to be fine. Recessive disorder is required that both parents are carriers for pathogenic variant in the same gene. Now current carrier screening guidelines by ACOG are very limited in genetic offering at this time. Cystic fibrosis is the only gene that is currently offered to all couples and this is what we call a pan-ethnic screening. On the other hand, if you belong to an Ashkenazi Jewish group, uh, you will be offered or recommended to be tested for nine genes that are highly prevalent among Ashkenazi Jews. Fragile X is offered to individuals that have a history of intellectual disability, developmental delay, autism, or primary ovarian insufficiency. Spinal muscular atrophy is recommended by ACOG only when there is family history or an affected individual, and hemoglobinopathies are usually screened by hemoglobin electrophoresis and are offered to individuals with African ancestry, Mediterraneans, uh, and Southeastern Asians. Now, clearly, this is a very small subset of potential diseases that can affect an individual. We do know that there are over 3,000 genes that can cause what we call Mendelian or single gene disorders that can cause uh, either developmental delay, intellectual disability, structural birth defects, early childhood, late childhood, and adulthood disorders. So why not screen for all of them? But previously this was not technologically possible, but now it is, and there are currently multiple commercial entities that provide carrier screening for over 100 disorders. Now it is important to understand that preconceptual panethnic testing outside of cystic fibrosis currently is not recommended by ACOG. Nonetheless, this is testing that some individuals will take because they want to eliminate as many potentially profound genetic disorders from being a possibility as they are trying to conceive. So tests in the past have shown that using this expanded carrier screening, as it is called, and assessing for more than 100 genes, that approximately one to four individuals will actually be carriers for Mendelian disorders. And this has actually been offered to couples that are undergoing in vitro fertilization for uh, potentially identifying disorders that may be amenable for preimplantation genetic screening. Now, next generation sequencing, where you actually sequence many hundreds of genes, has actually been attempted and has been shown uh, to identify that on average, each individual will carry approximately three pathogenic variants and that 2% of the females are positive for X-linked condition. Now, of course, the disadvantages of expanded carrier screening is that in many cases, the variants that are identified may have unknown significance, and therefore it is difficult to counsel the couple of what does a particular genetic change mean. Also, many conditions are extremely rare, and although a particular genetic change has been published in the literature because n is equal 1, it is really unclear whether this particular variant 
will also have the same effect on other babies. There is also a discrepancy between genotype and phenotype correlation for many genetic variants. And although we can calculate what the carrier frequency is for a particular genetic disorder, it doesn't mean that the incidence of this particular disorder will be calculatable by Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium equation based on the carrier frequency, meaning that the incidence could be much lower than the carrier frequency because you experience either early embryo loss or a later miscarriage or the gametes that carry that particular genetic variant uh, are eliminated and therefore not utilized in conception. As part of um, our effort to actually identify which variants are pathogenic, which variants are benign, and, and diminish the number of variants of unknown significance, NIH has put in a lot of effort to build databases that collect information on every variant that is detected by current sequencing technologies. And this is an example of a variant in a cystic fibrosis gene uh, that uh, shows that this variant is reviewed by several labs and was deemed to be pathogenic. And they, uh, this databases will only grow in their evidence and so that hopefully as more and more sequencing is done on more and more genes, we'll be able with more certainty to, to determine whether a particular variant does have any effect on a particular uh, individual or not. Now, as we discussed, the whole exome sequencing will identify 20 to 25,000 genes in the whole genome. So therefore, it will screen for all the known genes. And in pediatric populations, it can actually deliver diagnosis in 20 to 40 percent of the cases. But because whole exome analyzes all the known genes, it will also have sequenced genes that may predispose an individual for disorders that were not part of the initial indication. For example, a five-year-old child with seizures who had a diagnostic exome may have a pathogenic variant in a sodium channel that explains the seizure, but also has a pathogenic variant in a BRCA1 gene. So this, of course, is a finding that can be very important for the family to know because it goes just beyond the child because the mother could be the carrier, the father could be the carrier, and other family members could also be uh, affected. An American College of Medical Genetics has identified 56 genes that are deemed actionable, meaning they are, prevent they are preventative and surveillance measures that can make a difference to the individual. And some of these genes include hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, BRC, BRCA2, Lynch syndrome genes, one hip Lando syndrome genes, collagen vascular disorders genes, cardiomyopathy genes, and approximately 2 to 4 percent of the individuals that are assayed will carry a reportable incidental findings. Now, initially, the American College of Medical Genetics felt that whenever whole exome sequencing is done, that these results should be returned, and that there was a duty for the physician to return these results. However, there has been quite a bit of controversy since physicians, and especially pediatricians, did not feel comfortable reporting BRCA1 and later adult disorders predisposition to uh, children so that, uh, indeed, there is now an opt-out option for the parents not to receive this information, as well as there are, to, are some centers that will not want to report these incidental findings at all and will receive results that, where these genes are masked. Again, there is quite a bit of controversy, again, how these incidental findings should be reported and the process of reporting them is still being actively discussed. Now, genetic counseling plays a very important role. A genetic counselor uh, and genetic physician or healthcare provider, their role is to explain the objective of the test, to, to make the couple understand what the test will detect and not detect, and what are the possible outcomes of the test. Are the results, the results show a pathogenic variant that explains the disorder? or does the results only show benign findings, or 
that there are variants of unknown significance and what does that mean? And how does that all fit within the bigger clinical picture and within the pedigree? Because finding, not finding a pathogenic variant in a family pedigree that shows a strong disposition for disease doesn't mean that individual is not at risk. Because testing an individual can identify variants in that individual, this genetic information has significant effect on the entire family. Genetic discoveries may be predictive of future adverse events in not only individual but also family members. And the genetic information may affect future generations. And this is why it is important to look at the testing as testing really the whole family. And after the testing and the results are returned, then one needs to discuss how to reach out to other family members if testing needs to be done on these additional individuals and of course whether they are interested in testing at all. Whole exome sequencing that has currently been done and mainly on uh, uh, disorders that affect early childhood have also told us the importance of de novo variants. So, we know that many of the disorders are heritable from the parents. This is what the carrier screening is for. And as we can see on this pie chart, approximately 60% of the disorders are heritable. They can be either recessive, X-link, or autosomal, autosomal dominant. But almost 40% of the disorders are de novo, meaning that they have, they're not inherited from the parents. And if you tested parental blood, you will not find the genetic change. You will only find it in the subject that is being tested. So this is a very large contribution to clinical genetics and it is therefore very important to understand that carrier screening will not eliminate this large category of uh, affected uh, individuals. Now the normal genomic events could actually be due to either errors in meiosis when the gametes are being produced and uh, an example is that the abnormal segregation of whole chromosome that will lead to aneuploidy such as trisomy 21. The no events can happen during mitosis of the early embryo and lead to mosaicism where certain cells have normal chromosomal complement while others don't. Good example is a mosaicism for Turner syndrome. Well-known genetic diseases that can be due to de novo deletions or mutations include the George syndrome, tuberous sclerosis, and neurofibromatosis. So these are all de novo events that will not be detected through carrier screening because they're only present in the affected individual. Now, one uh, test that is currently being used to actually detect these de novo events is the pre implantation genetic screening. And the indications are listed here and range from personal reasons for sex selection, individuals who are concerned about just transferring euploid embryos, and there is data that uh, PGS may improve singleton pregnancy IVF, as well as reduce the incidence of uh, twins. Now, rate of aneuploidy does rise with age, but it has a U-shaped curve as shown here, the top panel, shows actually the aneuploidy among embryos and the bottom panel shows the rate of aneuploidy at live birth and as we can see they are both u-shaped with a nadir of about 20 percent for the embryos and this can increase to greater than 80 percent for individuals that are over 40 years uh, of age. So aneuploidy is very prevalent uh, among embryos and this is an example of a uh, representative chromosomal microarray where the DNA was extracted from uh, trophoblasts collected from uh, five day old blastocysts and uh, these, are, these are four embryos from one couple only one embryo was euploid as shown on the top while the other embryos either had trisomy 21, monosomy 11 and monosomy 15 and these changes are indicated by the change in intensity of the probes that's, that correspond to various chromosomes as displayed in this figure. It is also very important to understand the limitations of pre-implantation genetic screening. This is a screening test and therefore it will not detect aneuploidy 100%, meaning there are babies that can be born that are aneuploid. Screening 
at this point in time is really limited to whole chromosomes, not to microdeletions and microduplications, which account for significant pathology. PGS also will not test for triploidy, and it will not actually test for genetic conditions caused by single gene mutations, unless, of course, the couple is undergoing pre-implantation genetic diagnosis specifically for cystic fibrosis because they happen to be carriers for it. It is also important to understand that regardless of the ethnic background of the individuals, there is a relatively large 3 to 5 percent risk for birth defects that will not be diagnosed by pre-implantation genetic testing. And that even if the results of pre-implantation genetic screening is normal, the baby could still have a birth defect or intellectual disability uh, that is different from the causes not detected by pre-implantation genetic screening. And pre-implantation genetic screening does not replace prenatal testing such as chorionic villus sampling or amniocentesis or prenatal screening tests, as this is currently uh, recommended and is a standard of care. Now, following uh, implantation, the obstetricians offer post-implantation testing, and the mainstay of this testing up until this point has been the first trimester screening that is uh, composed of uh, nuchal translucency and serum analytes. The assay has a good detection rate, which is about 90%, but a relatively high false, false positive rate, whereby 5% of individuals will be deemed to be at risk. However, this particular technology is now being replaced by what we call cell-free fetal DNA. A cell-free fetal DNA assay has also been called NIPT, or non-invasive prenatal testing, NIPS, or non-invasive prenatal screening, but NIPT and NIPS terms are non-descriptive of the technology, and we have been doing non-invasive testing for many decades, and therefore cell-free DNA is a better term as it specifically identifies the assay used in non-invasive screening. Now, cell-free fetal DNA is the first application of whole genome sequencing to medicine. So unlike whole exome sequencing, where you're capturing just the coding regions of the genome, cell-free fetal DNA shears all of the DNA and sequences across the whole genome. Again, there are different ways to do cell-free fetal DNA. Some technologies sequence the whole genome. Some technologies actually capture parts of the genome. But nonetheless, cell-free fetal DNA was the first application of whole genome sequencing to medicine. It happens to be in reproductive medicine. Because fetal DNA is greater than 5% in many pregnancies, when the blood sample is drawn and plasma is separated, in plasma there is circulating fetal DNA that is mixed with maternal DNA. This DNA can be extracted, can be sequenced, and bioinformatic analysis can be actually performed to detect whether there is extra genetic material coming from the fetus. It is used to detect trisomy 21, trisomy 18, trisomy 13, and it can also detect sex chromosomes. Cell-free fetal DNA has a very high positive predictive value. It is about 40 to 50 percent predictive value, and this predictive value is approximately tenfold higher than first trimester screening. The negative predictive value approaches 100 percent. It is also important to know that in approximately 4 percent of the women, result may not be obtained, mainly because the cell-free fetal DNA is not present above the threshold of uh, 5% or so that the laboratory needs to be able to make a call. Current indications are still involve individuals that are at high risk for having aneuploidies. And here actually these conditions are uh, listed. Uh, it is however uh, important to understand that the performance of the assay is also excellent in low risk populations and it is only a matter of time before cell-free DNA replaces the first trimester screening as a test of choice in aneuploidy detection. It is also important to understand that because the assay derives an answer 
based on a sample that has a mixture of maternal and placental DNA, results may not always reflect fetal genomes. Maternal mosaicism such as monosomy X, maternal neoplasms, or even chromosomally abnormal lyomyomas can lead to difficulty in interpretation. Other sources for difficult to interpret uh, results include placental mosaicisms and vanishing twin whose placental remains continue to shed DNA. So it is important to therefore be sensitive that uh, the results may not always reflect the fetus but may also reflect what is going on in the mother. So current screening strategies that are in uh, the prenatal setting involve of course the ultrasound and first trimester screening shown as FTS. The uh, FTS can only be done in the first trimester while cell-free DNA can be done anytime uh, in the first trimester and beyond. And then we of course have the diagnostic uh, tools such as coronavirus sampling and amniocentesis. The uh, prenatal diagnostic procedures have actually become less common as more and more individuals rely on cell-free fetal DNA screening. However, it is very important to realize that cell-free DNA will only diagnose a fraction of genetic disorders. Because the aneuploides, as shown here, trisomy 21, 13, and 18, only will detect about 0.2%. Only 0.2% of the fetuses will have this. But if you actually look at the prevalence of pathogenic microdeletions and duplications, they are almost sixfold higher, 1.2%. And the pathogenic microdeletions and duplications will not be accurately diagnosed with cell free uh, DNA, and therefore, coronavirus sampling and amniocentesis is uh, needed. Now, of course, just to summarize this, it is important to understand that cell free DNA is a screening test. If the individual wants a diagnostic test and wants to utilize the full uh, high resolution microarrays that cover the whole genome, as well as whole exome sequencing that is entering prenatal diagnosis, then individual we will need to undergo coronary villus sampling and amniocentesis. And for the most cases, cell-free DNA is utilized to just detect aneuploides. Now the question becomes, because subchromosomal abnormalities, meaning microdeletions or deletions and duplications, because they constitute such a large proportion of abnormal genetic results, can those be diagnosed with cell-free fetal DNA? So here's actually a case of a couple who had a child that had intellectual disability, short stature, and dysmorphic features. The child inherited a 4.2 megabase deletion, uh, which was on chromosome 12 from the father. The couple was pregnant again, and we asked ourselves, can we actually diagnose this particular deletion that may or may not have been inherited from uh, the father. And so here actually is uh, the uh, pedigree where mother is shown in green and the father is shown in uh, blue uh, square and he has Asperger syndrome, uh, also small, smallish hands and short stature and he's the one that carries the uh, microdeletion. And they already have a daughter that is affected with this deletion and it has a failure to thrive, developmental delay, and dysmorphic features. And she's pregnant again. So in this particular example, we uh, took the plasma from the mother and we did, did very deep sequencing, which is shown uh, on the right side and circled and does show that there is a loss of signal from the region of the genome that corresponds to the paternal microdeletion. And indeed, when this baby was born, when we used the diagnostic tools, we show that indeed there was a 4.2 megabase deletion in this individual as shown in the bottom panel. So non-invasive microdeletion can actually be diagnosed using uh, cell-free fetal DNA. However, there is a very high false positive rate when non-invasive cell-free fetal DNA used to detect microdeletions. And it is therefore very important to understand that at this point in time, microdeletions are not, are not going to be detected uh, as well as uh, the whole chromosomal aneuploides. 
and we know that the discordance is at least at least 20% between the cell-free fetal DNA and the diagnostic testing, and the discordance will vary on the chromosomal region that is being assayed, and for many laboratories, the information regarding the exact positive predictive value, false positive, per chromosomal region is lacking. It is also very important that laboratories are actually careful in terms of how they report their testing and that they report for each assay what are various quality controls. How is the assay performed? What is the positive predictive value? What is the false positive, false negative for each genomic region that is being assayed? Because we need to understand that not every individual may interpret a positive result as being false positive. And it is also very important to understand, because these are screening tests, that a false positive result needs to be followed by a diagnostic test before an individual decides to make a decision of how to proceed with the pregnancy. Now, future belongs to, and the future is now, to whole exome and whole genome sequencing to rule out or rule in a syndrome uh, that is in utero. And uh, there are currently now uh, companies that do offer whole exome uh, and whole genome sequencing in the prenatal setting. It can be particularly useful for individuals who have lost a pregnancy that may have been due to a potentially genetic syndrome uh, due to either multiple structural abnormalities. And, and in these particular cases, uh, these diagnostic tools could be useful to assess the risk in future pregnancies. And another technology that uh, is being developed is whether one can isolate fetal cells from either maternal blood or cervix, and this actually would uh, obviate a lot of the problems that happen with cell-free fetal DNA where you're assaying both the maternal and fetal blood in the same assay. Here you will only be assaying the fetal cells and you'll be able to diagnose uh, exclusively fetal uh, genetic disorders. And this particular uh, technology of fetal cell isolation is still in the research phase, but probably has an important future. Now, what are the parental opinions regarding incidental findings in pregnancy if whole exome sequencing is uh, instituted? In this survey of approximately 190 individuals uh, regarding whether they wanted to know incidental findings, the 56 genes that we discussed, or genes that may affect or diagnose treatable childhood conditions or non-treatable childhood conditions, as well as treatable and untreatable adult awesome conditions, more than 70% of individuals indicated they would like to know those results. Of course, they would cause a lot of anxiety and variants of uncertain significance would also cause a lot of anxiety in pregnant moms who undergo whole, whole exome or whole genome sequencing. We don't have as much experience with whole exome sequencing in pregnancy, uh, but this is a new frontier that will gather more steam in the future, and there will be additional studies that will look at some of these questions and uh, assess how our individuals dealing with results of incidental findings prenatally. The turnaround time, of course, is very important in pregnancy. Whole exome sequencing in general takes several months to get that, back the diagnosis, although there are currently commercial uh, outfits that now have reduced the turnaround time to a few weeks. And if set up correctly, these results actually could be returned in as little as uh, 48 hours if uh, needs be. To conclude uh, this particular part of my presentation here, genomic approaches and the new next generation sequencing approaches have really, will really allow us to identify the vast majority of Mendelian disorders preconceptionally and prenatally. Therefore, what is heritable should be able to be diagnosed and it will be important for the pregnancy, it will be important for early interventions. However, as I also mentioned, expanded carrier screening requires additional studies because we don't understand the genotype-phenotype correlation 
between many of the variants. The reporting of incidental findings remains controversial, and because of that, the pretest counseling and follow-up is extremely important because these individuals often do not always understand what incidental findings are, what their implications are, and post-test uh, counseling and sometimes may sometimes require several test uh, sessions and of course pre-test counseling is very important for the couple to understand that ordering whole exome and whole genome testing will reveal uh, information that may have nothing to do with the phenotype that is being pursued. Genetic testing requires very rigorous quality control to avoid false positives, false negatives and variants of unknown significance but also for the clinicians to understand the limitations of genetic testing and the importance of understanding the difference between the screening test and the importance of following this up with the diagnostic testing. Also, the importance of databases of phenotype-genotype correlations such as ClinVar that will hopefully help us better understand uh, the uh, variants of unknown significance uh, but this correlation remains very high in reproductive medicine where the phenotyping that we do uh, in the embryology labs or prenatally uh, are still not connected to genotyping. And of course the whole exome and genome sequencing of embryos uh, will and is a new frontier with large ethical and legal implications but is probably the only way to diagnose the novel mutations because these mutations will not be present in the parents. A diagnostic exome, which is another name for whole exome uh, sequencing, the indications are multiple. The most of the use that currently a diagnostic exome uh, is utilized for is in early childhood disorders uh, individuals who have seizures and neurologic disorders is probably number one utilization for diagnostic exomes. Individuals that have also multiple structural birth defects and intellectual disability. Diseases that are due to early developmental disorders such as lack of uh, or underdevelopment of certain organs uh, is highly caused by highly penetrant genes. And in these individuals the yield of whole exomes and diagnostic exomes uh, approaches uh, 40%. The application of uh, exomes in uh, adult individuals, uh, especially if you have an undiagnosed disease where family history is suggestive of heritable disorder, in adults the diagnostic utility approaches about 10% at this point in time. Just to understand actually uh, the thinking behind whole exome and diagnostic exome and some of the details is that I will go through an example of uh, an individuals that had primary anemia. So uh, one uh, disorder that is a developmental disorder in many individuals are uh, women who present with hypergonotropic hypogonadism. And this is especially true with uh, young women who present with primary amenorrhea uh, or uh, secondary amenorrhea prior to age 25 or have familial ovarian failure. These disorders are likely to be due to a single gene uh, mutations and the application of whole exome sequencing has recently identified a number of genes, new genes that play a role in this disease. So here's an example of a family where we have a four generation pedigree. Uh, this family happens to be consanguineous and there are a number of uh, individuals to this uh, consanguineous couple and in the fourth generation we see that there are three black circles which indicates three uh, young women who are affected with hypergonotropic hypogonadism and their clinical uh, manifestation is that they have elevated follicle stimulating hormone levels, they have very low AMH, they have either very atrophic or small ovaries or ovaries that were not visualized, the karyotype was normal, antityroid antibodies and other tests for autoimmune disorders were negative uh, and so here we have uh, uh, a family where uh, the pedigree is telling us that this likely is an autosomal recessive disorder and because you have three affected individuals they are consanguineous and therefore it is likely that application of 
modern genetic tools could actually make a diagnosis. So the first tool that is used in this cases where you have consanguinity is to do a SNP array and these arrays will give us information uh, with regards to are there any copy number variations meaning deletions or duplications and it also will tell us uh, which regions along many chromosomes are shared between affected sisters so if you did an array on all of these individuals you would identify regions of homozygosity that are shared between affected sisters and the gene that accounts for their phenotype most likely lies in these regions of homozygosity. Now, in this particular case, we identified several regions of homozygosity that were shared by the sisters. And none of these regions contained well-characterized genes such as follicle stimulating hormone receptor or BMP15, genes that have been implicated in hypergonotropic hypogonadism. So we want to pursue whole exome sequencing on these um, individuals and in these family members. And it is important that when we analyze nucleotide variants that we need to use a criteria that is family specific and disease specific when we analyze this data. So first thing that we look at is what is the frequency of the variant in the population? Well, we know the frequency of primary amenorrhea is, a, and the incidence is approximately 1 in 10,000. So if the incidence is 1 in 10,000, then using the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium equation, uh, we can calculate that the variant frequency is going to be less than 1%. So all of the common variants that are present in the population are unlikely to account for the phenotype in this family. We also have to look at the mode of inheritance, and as I discussed before, because they are a consanguineous family, first cousins, the most likely mode of inheritance is autosomal recessive, and we also have a more than one individual affected while the parents and other members do not appear to be affected. But you always have to be thinking there could be other modes of inheritance. It doesn't always have to be recessive. Now, what kind of a variant is it? So when you identify the variant, clearly variants that cause large disruption in the gene functions, what we call frame shift variants or stop coding or splicing variants, these variants are more likely to explain the phenotype rather than a variant that only causes one amino acid change. Also, is the nucleotide variant concerned? Meaning, if you change this nucleotide, will you change the amino acid? And if you change the amino acid, is this an amino acid that is conserved in mice, elephants, fish, yeast, fruit flies? Clearly, the amino acids that are changed, that are conserved across many different organisms, means that they may play an important role, although not always. Because this is a hypergonotropic hypogonadism, and we assume that the defect lies somewhere in the ovary during ovarian development, the gene should be expressed in the ovary. And the other element is, are there animal models that prove that this particular gene in which you would think there is a variant, have animal models shown that this particular gene is important in ovarian development? or not. So in, in this case we would then extract genomic DNA from the affected individuals and parents. The uh, exome will capture the exons and exome interjunctions and then the next generation sequencing machines will sequence these captured regions and the bioinformatics tools will then take all of our previous considerations into account to generate a set of gene variants that may account for the phenotype in this family. Now, who do you sequence? Well, it, 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 you could certainly sequence the individual who presents to you. However, uh, this is suboptimal because she may carry a de novo mutation, and de novo mutation, you will not know whether it's de novo unless you have the parents, because parents will allow you to determine what is present only in the affected individual but not in the parents. The optimal, therefore, sequencing 
strategy is to sequence all three, the father, mother, and the affected individual. And a superior uh, sequencing strategy, which of course tends to be more costly, is if you can sequence not only the trio, but also unaffected, uh, and, uh, and, uh, but also include the unaffected individuals or additional affected individuals in the family. So if there are two uh, sisters that are affected, it's best to sequence both of them uh, because they both will uh, likely, if they have the same phenotype, they both carry the same variant that is causing this phenotype and it will help with the bioinformatics. Now it's important to understand that the couple that is being tested, that they understand that these technologies will reveal paternity. And uh, this can be revealed uh, with a SNP array or with a whole exome sequencing. Uh, and therefore the couple needs to be counseled about uh, uh, this uh, revelation. Also, the sequencing will reveal what is the relationship between family members. There are family members who do not realize they're related to each other. And here is an example of a uh, individual who uh, was sequenced. Uh, actually, this individual had a SNP array done. And as you can see here, the blue blocks that are next to the chromosomes indicate uh, regions of homozygosity, meaning regions where both the paternal and the maternal chromosomes are identical. And when you count this, you determine that this uh, individual has 25% homozygosity, meaning 25% of the genomic material between the paternal and the maternal genome that was inherited is identical. And therefore, this individual is highly likely to be a result of a first-degree incest. So these tests will identify family relationship, and that's very important that uh, the couple also understands. Now, going back to this particular family again, uh, we sequenced the uh, individuals in asterisks. So these were the parents, the uh, three affected daughters, as well as two unaffected uh, individuals. And what came out is that uh, this in this family, the individual carried a mutation in uh, MCM8 uh, gene. Uh, and this actually was a, a missense mutation. Now, in this particular case, we didn't know previously that this gene was involved in hypergonotropic hypogonadism. So whenever you uh, discover a gene that may not be involved or previously has not been involved, there is a higher burden of proof that indeed this particular variant causes the disease. Now what helps here is the animal model and again all of this data is publicly available in databases uh, and in mice when you eliminate MCM8 or its interacting partner MCM9 you find that these animals don't develop normal ovaries as shown on the right. The top picture is a normal ovary with follicles and oocytes and the bottom panel shows uh, a animal that doesn't produce MCM8 and whose ovaries uh, are basically uh, that don't contain any follicles and the ovary is atrophic. So this is strong evidence that indeed MCM8 does play an important role in ovarian uh, development. Also, we know that MCM8 is actually involved in chromosomal stability. So lack of MCM8 will cause chromosomal instability and increased breaks in chromosomes. As shown in panel A is a picture of a normal looking chromosomal spread. Looked like nice thin spaghetti, but under B shows that from individuals that carry the mutation, when you expose these cells to mitomycin C that induces DNA double-stranded breaks, the cell is not able to repair them, so their chromosomes look broken and very abnormal. So all of this uh, data 
is a strong data that in this particular family, MCM8 is the cause of the hypergonotropic hypergonadism. However, you also have to be careful because consanguineous families have a relatively large number of regions of homozygosity, and it could be that they carry other genetic variants that make the phenotype more penetrant and more profound than it would be in individuals that were not consanguineous. And genome-wide association studies are studies that have used SNP array tools, as we discussed, to look for association of uh, disease or a particular physiologic state and um, the population. And GEWA studies for the age of menopause have actually been very, very fruitful in identifying almost 44 regions across the genome that associate with the age of natural menopause. And interestingly, if you look at which genes are in these regions, 29 out of 44 regions contain genes that are involved in DNA damage response. Now, it is very important to understand that genome-wide association studies do not identify genes that are causing or determining age of natural menopause. It will only identify the region where there may be a gene that plays an important role. But nonetheless, this data suggests that genes that are important in chromosomal stability and DNA biochemistry also play an important role in uh, natural menopause. And if you look at the genes that lie in these regions, the gene that has the most or the strongest association signal is MCM8. So MCM8 is not only important in causing primary amenorrhea, hypergonotropic hypogonadism when inherited as a Mendelian trait, autosomally recessive, but that there is a signal in this region of MCM8 that also determines menopause and therefore plays an important role from formation of the ovary to the senescence of the ovary and the future studies really are going to be focused as, as using the genomic data to understand complex genetic traits of which menopause is one of them. So to conclude this part on uh, the application of genomic technologies to uh, hypergonotropic hypergonadism to menopause is that uh, we are identifying that DNA damage repair genes are associated uh, with natural and early menopause and this may suggest that ovary is a biosensor of overall somatic aging because some of these genes will also affect somatic development and somatic biology and that as we move in the future the animal models will actually play an important role for us to understand the full implication of genetic variation to the phenotype. So when we see an individual with hypergonotropic hypogonadism, we usually focus on their lack of ovaries, uh, but we don't phenotype them as well in terms of potentially other problems. Um, and variants in different genes may have various effects on individuals' heart or individuals' bones or individuals' muscles. And this, at this point in time, we don't assay this in clinical medicine, but animal models will become an important aspect of our ability to actually understand what these variants do besides affecting ovarian function. Now going to population health, as part of the promise of using molecular medicine to understand better how human body functions and to use this knowledge to treat individual for who they are and what their molecular biology is, President Obama initiated a precision medicine, precision medicine initiative in 2015. And the goal of this initiative really, although mainly focused on uh, 
tumors and cancers, identifying variants that can be then targeted pharmacologically is also to understand how precision medicine can be applied to a population as a whole. Now, population-based precision medicine does not have to um, does not have to be opposite to uh, public health. The individual public health approach is actually uh, can be complementary. And one specific example of that is actually newborn screening, where uh, genetically targeted approaches have found benefit for uh, newborns. And of course, the precision medicine will have many important effects just like the human genome projects in developing new platforms, new public data sets uh, that will be useful for, technician, uh, for physicians to process the genetic information and to uh, deliver better care to their patients. Now, precision medicine does not only involve genomics, it involves, of course, proteomics, metabolomics, many other parts of omics. Uh, but genomic medicine is playing an important role because the genome currently is relatively easy to measure. There are a lot of instruments to measure it um, precisely and therefore provides uh, for a first foray into uh, omics and precision medicine. The genomic team involves a number of individuals. You need to have genetic counselor, clinical geneticist, uh, you need to be interacting with laboratories that will do the testing. There needs to be biotics to deal with issues of incidental findings, of return of information, uh, and of course of biobanking of the tissues. And there are also the importance of new programs such as clinical informatics fellowship programs uh, of how to actually deliver and process this information through health systems. Now, it is also very important that genomic medicine and genomic technologies do not widen the divide between haves and the have-nots, and this is very, very true of reproductive medicine. Now, we always have to be on guard to make sure that this doesn't happen. If you look at the population and we look hypothetically at 250,000 participants, whose genomes we will sequence, and we take that 2 to 4 percent of these individuals will have incidental findings, or 56 six genes that are currently recommended as being reported back to the individuals, we will identify 5 to 10,000 individuals that have potentially pathogenic variants in these 56 genes. And if we expand this to at-risk relatives, we will identify additional 15 to 30,000 individuals who are at risk because they are related to these individuals that carry the pathogenic variant uh, that initially participate in the population base. That is a total of 20 to 40,000 individuals will actually carry single gene uh, disorders that can affect their health. And if you look actually at the top three most prevalent conditions that were returned in the Geisinger Health System, and these are studies being uh, performed by Dr. David Ladbetter and the Geisinger Health System Precision Medicine Initiative, these are familial hypercholesterolemia, hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome, and Lynch syndrome. So two out of three of these disorders have reproductive medicine meaning. And uh, more than 1% actually of uh, individuals were affected with one of these uh, disorders. What we're also realizing from the population-based studies is that um, family history is not the best predictor of whether you are a carrier for BRCA1 or BRCA2. So current recommendations that rely on strong family history and a pedigree are estimated to miss almost 50 percent of cases uh, and therefore uh, it is that there actually has been um, an impetus 
to examine whether population-based screening for certain high penetrance cancer genes is viable uh, and whether it should be instituted. But just like expanded carrier screening risk, one runs into the problems of variants of unknown significance, their interpretation, interpretation, and the fear that some of this may be misinterpreted and lead to unnecessary uh, surgeries such as mastectomies. Now, as part of this precision medicine initiative and the whole genomic medicine, there are now websites uh, such as the ClinGen that are public resources for clinicians when a mutation in BRCA1 uh, is reported, then the clinicians can actually look at the uh, summary of the uh, uh, what what is the meaning of identifying a variant in BRCA1, what is the likelihood of disease, what is the effectiveness of interventions, and what kind of interventions are there for this individual. And of course, as more and more individuals are sequenced, more and more we understand how pathogenic these variants are. Um, we will have better uh, information uh, that will be deposited in these data sets and that is available to any uh, clinicians who actually is interested in looking into this uh, information. So in conclusion, The uh, population-based genomic medicine has just uh, begun to be studied and um, the utility of these genomic approaches uh, potentially could play an important role in identifying highly penetrant single gene, i.e. Mendelian disorders such as the breast cancer genes and other genes that fall under that category. However, the uh, utility of whole genome sequencing in understanding more complex genetic disorders such as diabetes, hypertension, and other diseases uh, is currently also under very um, heavy study uh, by large data centers that are sifting through all of this genomic information uh, and overlaying it over the clinical information and trying to uh, uh, identify algorithms that can predict health outcomes. And of course, this is something that uh, uh, is currently happening and will be happening for uh, the years to come uh, and we will just have to see what uh, comes uh, out of all of this. So I would like uh, to um, end this that uh, um, some of this data and, and uh, some of this uh, presentation is very much due to uh, my team at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center and McGee Women's Hospital. And uh, this is actually the team uh, that uh, has been involved in some of the studies that have been uh, presented in this uh, presentation. Thank you very much for uh, your attention.